Now, Mr. Hodge, where do we go the, from here? The next witness is Ms. Saparovich. She'll be very brief, Commissioner. Yes. If you'd go into the witness box, please, Ms. Barovich. Do you mind, uh, do you want to uh, uh, take an oath or make an affirmation? I'll take the oath. Yes. Swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down. Yes, Ms. Neskovshin. Thank you, Ms. Saparovich. Um, is your full name Carol Saparovich? Yes, it is. And your business address is 275 Kent Street, Sydney, New South Wales? That's correct. And your occupation is Head of Reward and Performance Management for Consumer Bank, Business Bank and Support Functions at Westpac Group? Yes, that's correct. Mr. Saparovich, did you receive a summons to attend the commission today? Yes, I did. If I could tender that, that's the original of the summons. Exhibit 3.26, summons to Mr. Saparovich. Mr. Saparovich, you've prepared two witness statements. Do you have both of those with you? Yes, I do. Uh, the first witness statement is in relation to rubric 310. Yes. Do you have that? Yes. Can I ask you to go to paragraph 17, please, Mr. Parovich? Yes. You see that paragraph 17 is under a heading local business managers or def with a definition. Yes. And you see that paragraph 17 begins, I set out the KPIs that apply to RMs. Right. Is that an error? Yes, I think it is. Do you have a pen? What should it be? It should be LBMs. Could you just mark that um, and initial it, please? Is your statement otherwise true and correct? Yes, I'm comfortable with it. Tender that, Commissioner. Give it 3.27, witness statements, Parovich, concerning rubric 3-10. Mr Parovich, you also prepared a statement in relation to um, rubric 3-11? Yes. Do you have that in front of you? I do. Are there any changes you wish to make to that statement? No, I don't. Is the statement otherwise true and correct? Yes, it is. Tend to that statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.28, witness statements, Parovich, concerning rubric 3-11. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr. Hall. Mr. Parovich, you're presently the Head of Reward and Performance Management for the Consumer Bank, Business Bank and Support Functions at Westpac. Correct. And you've been in that role since June of 2015? So principally, yes. I did have a short stint in the consumer bank as the head of HR there for about 10 months in 2016. Right, you might just need to move in slightly closer to the microphone. Thank you. And you've given two statements. I'm just going to talk to you about one of them, which is in relation to the Marjo case study. And I just want to focus on some changes in performance stand or key performance indicators between 2012 and 2017. Is it fair to say there have been, Westpac's made a number of reforms to the performance indicators that it uses for its bankers? Yes, over that time, yeah, we've, we've certainly made some changes and evolved our frameworks. All right, and perhaps if we do this just by reference to some exhibits, mm -hmm. can we go to exhibit number three, which is WBC.104.002.2449. Yes. This is the first half of 2012 scorecard review. That's correct. And does this explain what the role-based scorecard is for a, amongst other things, Westpac local banker for the period of I think 1 October 2011 to 31 March 2012. Yeah, that's correct. And if we go to page 2462, 
Mm -hmm. So this is the local business banker scorecard metrics and weightings. That's right. And perhaps if we just start with what the gate openers mean. So one of the gate openers, the last one, sales, is achieve 80% of revenue portfolio growth. That's correct. And another is LBB portfolio NPS. What does NPS stand for? So that's net promoter score, which is our customer advocacy measure. And is that a score that's arrived at by obtaining feedback from customers based on their dealings with Westpac? Yeah, that's correct. It, it would be in this case specific to that LBBs rather than the broader brand or branch, it would be specific to the banker. Because there's two different, am I right in thinking, there's two different ways in which you, well, there's two different inputs into a net promoter score. One is the brand or can be the brand score. The other is the individual employee score. And then they'll get averaged. Uh, so for, for this year, it was just the business banker but score. at this time, it's only the banker that's, yep, that's taken correct. into account. And if, for example, they get three people that say they've done an excellent job and one person that says they've done a satisfactory job and one person that says they've done a poor job, then there's a, a calculation that's made to determine what their score is. That's correct, it, right. yeah. And what does it mean that there's these red boxes around two of those gate openers? I don't know why the, the red boxes are around there. They apply to all of them. So all four gate openers need to be satisfied, is that right? Yes, all of the gate openers there would need to be satisfied to be eligible for variable reward. And then in terms of... I'm sorry, go on, were you saying something? No, I was just saying they need to be satisfied to be eligible for a variable reward payment. And, and the calculation of the variable reward payment is then done by reference to the balance scorecard? That's correct. And at the time, the balance scorecard weighted very heavily towards financial measures? Yes, that's correct. And in 2000, uh, well, if we take the first column, second half of 2011, there were two types of financial objectives, which were portfolio revenue growth and branch revenue growth from SME. And then there was also a customer metric, which also seems to be concerned with bringing in more customers. Is that right? Uh, so that was, well, it was growth in connections with eight plus products. So yes. Or I suppose we, rather than bringing in more, it's really a cross selling. Yes, it's it reflects the depth of relationship with the, that customer. A, a connection is a customer? Yes. And eight plus products means that they've risen up to taking at least eight products from Westpac. Yes. All right. And so this is measuring how many products the banker has managed to cross sell to the connections. It, it would take into account um, areas that the banker would have specifically supported that customer plus other parts of our, our group may have also met those needs. I see. And then, as you know, there was an independent review conducted by Stephen Sedgwick in 2017 in relation to banking remuneration. Yes. And Mr Sedgwick concluded that financial gateways such as those that were in place in Westpac were a high-risk practice. Yes, he recommended that they be removed. And there have been changes that Westpac is now making to its KPIs and scorecard and gateways to try to reflect that? Yes, we've already removed any financial gate openers in all of our arrangements. So if we go to exhibit nine, which is wbc.107.003.1047. Sorry, what was the exhibit? Uh, it should be number nine to your statement. Number nine, yes and go to page 1064. Yes. And 
this is, or well, this seems to now be the performance framework for a local business banker. It looks a lot more complicated. Can you explain how it works? Uh, so we continue to have um, the same sort of gate openers around behaviours and our risk and compliance requirements as a start. Um, then the overall determination of their performance and their variable reward is determined by the leader taking into account their behaviours, uh, their performance against our risk requirements, as well as the role-based scorecard. So historically, uh, the role-based scorecard was sort of the key component that would calculate their variable reward. It's now only one of the elements that the leaders will consider along with their behaviours and risk sort of performance. And the changes that have been made over the last few years, they reflect... Sorry, I, I think you need to go back over that. You lost me. Go back over the answer you just gave and explain it again. I'm sorry. Let's take it in a few yep. pieces. So let's start with the behaviour and compliance gates. Yes. So, so the first point you were making was you keep as part of your behaviour and compliance gates behaviours and risk considerations. Yes, the compliance gate is the mandatory training and the 10 days consecutive leave. So if they don't comply against those, they're not eligible for variable reward. And that's, then... And sorry, just to pause, that's the... Again, because it's a difficult diagram to follow, that is set out in the box down on the bottom left-hand corner. To participate in variable reward, these are the thresholds. The only thresholds are behaviour and compliance gates. Is That's that right? correct. We no longer have any financial gates. All right. And then the part which is under holistic performance assessment, that's the part then relevant to dealing with the actual amount or of potential uh, variable, variable reward. remuneration that might be paid? Yes, that's correct. All right. And... Do you want to then just, again, take us through the process that this is setting out as to how that's assessed? Yes. So the, the role-based scorecard, you know, continues to be in place for these roles and the leaders will consider performance against both the financial and non-financial components and measures. But on top of that, um, we also wanted to give consideration to positive adjustments in variable reward for behaviours and, and risk performance as well. So leaders actually take a more holistic view of how that bank has performed to determine their final variable reward. And, and we do have quite objective reporting and data to support the, the risk considerations component. Well, you're going to have to explain that to me in words of one syllable. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. You're going to have to take it much more slowly. OK. So the final variable reward commissioner is determined by looking at the scorecard yeah. outcomes, as well as how the banker has performed against clear risk requirements for their role, as well as have their... An assessment made by the immediate line manager or leader. So the, the risk considerations are actually um, determined by our second line risk team. So they will monitor and report and, and determine whether somebody's you know, performed appropriately against that. But the leader will you know, have access to that information. And then behaviours is in line with our Westpac group values and also our Westpac code of conduct. Our leaders would consider how our bankers have behaved. Now, pausing the there, those are subjective assessments made by the relevant manager, is that right? <laughs> yes, that's correct. And are they, how are they recorded? Are they recorded as a score or a, a, a grade from... Uh... Yes, historically there has been an assessment for the behaviours and it was recorded in our performance system. Yes. Go on. So can we... I'm not sure whether this will help or hinder attempting to explain this a little bit better. If we go back to page... 1057. And I wonder whether we... This is generic rather than 
specific to the role? Yes, it's the overall framework. I wonder whether it's easier if we work backwards, which is ultimately the amount of variable remuneration that is going to be paid to a Westpac employee is done by a recommendation being made to what I think is well, and then approved by the Divisional Remuneration Oversight Committee, is that right? Yes, the overall spend. And for each role, there's what's referred to as a target variable reward? That's correct. And is that the maximum, is the target variable reward the maximum amount of variable remuneration that an employee can earn? No, it can be higher than that. They can earn higher than the target variable reward? Yes. And is the target amount capped at one times the salary of the employee? No, so the maximum variable reward is capped at one time salary. Okay, a, an employee of Westpac can't earn more than 100% of their fixed salary as a variable reward. Yes, in these roles, you cannot earn more than one time salary. And so for each role, there's separately a target variable reward that is set. And in order to earn that target variable reward, you have to have first passed through the behaviour and compliance gateways, otherwise you get no variable reward. That's correct. And then when it comes to actually figuring out what part of that target variable reward you get, what, what is the mathematics that goes into that? So again, there, there would be some overall guidance provided to our leaders um, within the available pool that we have you know, in, ter in terms of variable reward. Um, so if somebody was a good performer across all those elements, then we would give some guidance around how much of that VR target they could, they could you know, vest for that individual. And equally, if there was a higher performer, we'd provide a range for that high performance as well. Okay, so there's, and I, I don't know whether this is ultimately going to help us to understand this, but when you look at the scorecard goals on the right-hand side of the page, mm -hmm. where it's 50% customer and 50% financial, that is the only component or one component of what goes into this assessment being made of whether somebody is a high performer or not? So it's one component. Okay, and then a second component is the outcome of individual performance goals for the employee? Yes, if there were some separate performance goals agreed, the leader would consider that as well. And then the third component is the leader's assessment of whether or not the employee has met the role, what are referred to as the role deliverables and development goals. Yes. And that could also be a, that could be, I think you were saying, a f financial goals or include financial goals. Yeah, the majority of the financial goals do sit within the scorecard. Under the 50% financial? Yes. But some, financial goals will sit within the role deliverables and development goals? So for, for these roles, um, the, the scorecard goals tend to represent the majority of the goals. It's, it's unusual to have anything else in role deliverables or individual, but it could happen. And then behaviours and risk considerations are also taken into account in some way? Yes. And how is that? So that is a discretionary determination by the leader. Okay. And so there's guidance. Is that guidance set out in this document? No, so the, the guidance would come once, you know, the business performance period has completed and we know exactly how much variable reward pool we have and then we'd give the guidance to our leaders to help them make those decisions. Right, and is it, did I understand you correctly before to say it is possible to earn more as variable remuneration than what the target remuneration is for the role? Yes, it's possible. And if that's if you are assessed as performing exceptionally well? Yes. Okay. And the, what I think you referred to before as second line of 
effectively second line of defence assessment? Yes, second that, line risk, yeah. Is that the internal risk and Yes, our internal section? risk function. And what could you just explain what the role is of the internal risk function in relation to setting remuneration? Yes, so in terms of our framework, they actually set um, the, the risk considerations for the <coughs> role and, and the appetite. Um, over and above that, they also will independently work with our reward governance committee to consider any matters from either operational risk incidents or outlier reporting that we might do or misconduct that we're, we're aware of um, to make sure that we're comfortable with that leader assessment and there's no further adjustment that's required for what we know through the second line team. And is the idea of these various changes that have been made to de-emphasise financial goals as part of assessing variable remuneration? It's, it's certainly to reflect a, a balanced sort of set of considerations for these roles. Well, let me look at the right-hand box. Scorecard goals will remain a strong indicator used in assessing performance. What am I to take away from that, Ms. Paravich? So it, it absolutely is still, you know, the key components of um, how we measure success for those roles. And Fifty percent of those are financial. Yes, that's correct. But it I, uh, can I cut to the chase, Ms. Paravich? When I go through the language, I see a lot of words there. But I am struck by the fact that scorecard goals will remain a strong indicator used in assessing performance and that uh, of those uh, scorecard goals, 50% are financial. Yes. Now, uh, what am I missing? So the, the variable reward is really our mechanism for people to share in our business success. Um, and, and these roles, you know, play a key role in contributing towards, you know, achieving those those goals. You know, we can measure their contribution down to an individual banker level. It's, it's a very objective view of their performance and contribution. Um, and we know we can afford the variable reward if we've achieved that business performance. So there's a number of considerations around, you know, alignment to business performance, as well as, you know, a fair and consistent way for our people to be rewarded for how they've contributed to our success. Can I perhaps try to help you to contrast the way it was with the way it is? When we were looking at the scorecard as it was mm -hmm. five years ago, there were a number of different criteria and each of them would have a particular percentage allocated to them. You recall that? Yes. And was the way that it used to work that there was an amount, a maximum amount of variable remuneration that you could earn and you, what percentage of that that you would get would depend upon what percentage you managed to achieve in each of those categories. Yes, it was mainly a formulaic calculation. And so a change from your perspective is that this is no longer a formulaic calculation of variable remuneration. That's correct. It is more discretionary and more holistic than it was back in 2012. And one significant change then, you would say, is that if you looked at the old scorecard five years ago, selling, either by selling the new business or cross-selling was the fundamental way in which you went about earning the maximum amount of variable remuneration. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it was the way we determined the variable reward we would pay to our bankers. And in terms of that idea of encouraging what you want out of your bankers, at the time it was inevitable that what you would be encouraging them to do was to sell. So, I mean, selling and you know, supporting customer needs is their role. 
And what, but what you're trying to do now is, I'm not trying to trick you, I'm trying to sort of help you to explain and answer the Commissioner's question. What you're trying to do now is to change the incentives and encouragements that you're giving to your staff. Is that fair? Well, I, I think what we're saying is, is we want to reward on a more holistic set of considerations. And historically, yes, it was anchored in the business performance outcomes and they were heavily financial. Saying we want to do things in a more holistic way can be, from, from a lawyer's perspective, sound like management speak that doesn't necessarily carry a lot of meaning. But can I go, and I think that might be one of the things that we're just struggling with, but can I just try to highlight one thing that you're wanting to point out, which is, I think you're wanting to point out, five years ago, if you were an employee of Westpac, you knew unequivocally that 80%, 85% of your variable remuneration depended on things that were effectively financial goals. It was the way we calculated that outcome. And now, if you're an employee of Westpac, you at least don't know that. You don't know that 85% of your variable remuneration depends on hitting financial goals. Yeah, so it's not formulaic. That's right. Yeah. So on, you know, on any view, you would say that, regardless of what exactly somebody understands from holistic, there has been a de-emphasis on that intense focus on a sales culture. Yes, but I, I, what I would say also is that the only time that somebody is considered for variable reward is where they meet our behavioural expectations and where they also meet the risk and compliance, compliance requirements for the role. So they are only eligible to receive a bonus if they've done that in the right way. All right. Commissioner, I don't have any more questions. Mr. Yes. Paravich. Yes, Ms. Ms. Coulson. Nothing for Mr. Paravich, if she could yeah. be excused. Yes, thank you, Mr. Paravich. I step down. Now, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, we're now going to change case studies. Could we adjourn for five minutes to switch the parties around? I'll come back at... Uh, Shortly before 3.15. Thank you.